I'm Connor Old, and welcome back to another episode of Old's Oscar Countdown, the second bonus episode of this week. Just yesterday, I gave my thoughts on the SAG nominations as well as the DGA nominations. So if you want to hear my up-to-date latest uh, Chris, uh, Oscar thoughts, check out that video. But I wanted to come back today and do another video to give my predictions for Sunday. The Critics' Choice Awards will be happening and I wanted to give my predictions, see how well I do. This was The first time I predicted this award show was last year and we did all right. And But this year I, I feel like I have another sort of better understanding of the award show and what they like to do which makes them different from the oscars so hopefully we'll do a little bit better than last year what last year was definitely a great start and i'm, I'm happy with that so i'm going to be covering just a brief kind of thoughts on all of my predictions if you want to hear my thoughts on, on certain categories check the description below for the timestamps for my thoughts they'll be there um, but there's not gonna be a huge explanation for each category just some brief thoughts as to why i picked one movie or the other so without further ado, let's jump into my predictions, starting off with the big one, the best picture, in which I'm going to predict Oppenheimer will win. I think a lot of people, when they looked at the nominations, they went, oh, Barbie, the most nominations ever for a Critics' Choice movie, that's going to win best picture. It got the most nominations, right? Well, if you look and, and dig a little deeper in your analysis, you'll find out that Barbie and Oppenheimer actually had pretty much the same amount of nominations. Because if you take away Barbie's nominations that Oppenheimer couldn't compete in, things like best the three nominations for Best Original Song, or getting nominated for Best Comedy, or get, getting nominated for Best Young Performer, if you take away those uh, nominations, Oppenheimer and Barbie had the same amount. So I think it was almost under-discussed just how much this award group definitely loves um, Oppenheimer just as much as Barbie. And I think they usually like to predict the Oscars. That's what they've been in recent years. They've really been trying to match and be a predictor for the Oscars. And I think Oppenheimer right now at this time is the front runner to win. There isn't sort of a number two contender unless the Critics' Choice decide to deem one. But it seems like right now they'll follow the trend of giving it to Oppenheimer. And I think it will make sense also for this awards group. It's got the commerciality, so it appeals to uh, this, this very large group of voters that because you have this many voters has a little bit more of a populist appeal, likes more of the, the bigger blockbusters or the more generally uh, emotional, easy to understand type stories rather than the prestige art house movies. They'll be a little bit more populist. Oppenheimer fits that bill while also still being prestige while also being a great director who's never won before, who's been nominated many times at this award show. There's just so many things to, to add up. I think Oppenheimer will be the winner um, come Critics' Choice Night. Then for Best Actor, I went with Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer. I think, you know, coming off the success of the Golden Globes and his excellent speech that he gave and the support and sort of going off the support of Oppenheimer, he really is the center of that film and delivers a great performance. And like I said with Best Picture, I think this group really does try to predict the Oscars and I think Killian Murphy is the frontrunner to win. I don't think they're going to go rogue and go with a Bradley Cooper in a movie like Maestro to be different. If he were to win anywhere, it probably would be the Golden Globes. So the fact that Killian Murphy won at the Globes, I think that uh, the Critics' Choice will st group will still want to ultimately try to predict the Best Actor winner, which is why, you know, even though they loved a movie like Everything Everywhere All at Once last year, they didn't give Michelle Yeoh the Best Actress award because they were trying to predict the Oscars and they thought it would be Kate Blanchett. So I think uh, ultimately it will uh, go to the front runner in this category to win the, the Oscar, which is Killian Murphy. Then the best actress category, I have Lily Gladstone in Killers of the Flower Moon. I think she cemented her front runner status at the Globes when she gave that excellent speech. Killers of the Flower Moon was a heavily nominated movie at this awards group, and this awards group likes to spread the love around. They like to reward all the different types of movies in different categories, which is why, you know, everything, everywhere, all at once will win Best Picture, but then lose in the Best Comedy category. Does it make sense? Not really. But what it indicates to us is that this group likes to spread the love, and I don't have any again, Killers of the Flower Moon winning in any other categories, so I wanted to show some, some support here. I think the success of her performance is also really well liked with the Globe speech, combined with the fact that, you know, even if she didn't win the Golden Globes, the critics have been the, the people that have been championing this performance. She's been winning a lot of critics' prizes over someone like an Emma Stone. It's really been the critics that have been behind this performance. So 
even if she didn't win the Golden Globes, I still probably would have predicted Lily Gladstone because she's been having that sort of great critical support. But the fact that she did win the Golden Globes and did, did give a great speech, I will think that, that will sort of convert certain people to, to vote for her. And I think she is the front runner to win for the Oscars. And I do think that, like I said, the Critics' Choice are going to try to predict and match the Oscars. Then, Best Supporting Actor, I have Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer. I feel like he is just starting his campaign, very charming. Uh, the critics like that because they don't get as much, you know, always press access as some of the, the Golden Globes voters or the Academy, of course, are made up of celebrities. The critics' choice like that factor of him being charming and sweet in a movie that I expect to be really well liked. In a and really because he won a Golden Globes, I don't really see the number two. It was Charles Melton at one point, but I think he may not even get nominated at the Oscars, so they're not going to vote for him there. Mark Ruffalo, you know, got snubbed at SAG, so he's not the number two. Robert De Niro is well liked, but I don't sense the passion. Robert Downey Jr., I think, has got the strength of the film, has the passion, has the charm, has the performance, has got everything enough to ultimately to get the win. So I think Robert Downey Jr. should easily win in this category just because he has the popular appeal, because he's in a movie that is prestige but then also I think a lot of people, of course, know him because he's in his role as Iron Man and those movies, which were, of course, very mainstream, and this is more of a mainstream awards body, so they'll appreciate Robert Downey Jr. as an actor, and now they have to vote for him in a movie that they really like in Oppenheimer. Then Best Supporting Actress, I went with Divine Joy Randolph, who, in The Holdovers, who doesn't really have any kind of competition. At one point it was Danielle Brooks, it was maybe Emily Blunt, but she doesn't have a lot to do in Oppenheimer and Danielle Brooks in The Color Purple. The Color Purple has been disappointing in terms of nominations and I don't think has a lot of support. So by default, I think Divine Joy Randolph giving a, a notable performance and a, a great performance in this movie and has a lot of screen time, so she's very memorable when you think of the holdovers. I think this will be the holdovers. Uh, big award of, of the night and then also one other which I'll talk about later but really there's no number two similarly to Robert Downey Jr. Divine Joy Randolph not only has been well, has won at Golden Globes but also actually actually has been uh, sneakily picking up a lot of critics awards too so um, it, it just makes too much sense. Best director I went with Christopher Nolan it's his time he's been nominated multiple times at this awards group and never won he's got the movie of the year he has the appreciation for what he did in terms of making this a box office movie, popular, but prestige, but also entertaining, well-established auteur, never won. It's his time. He's got the narrative. No one's going to win for best director. Now getting into the more interesting technical categories, uh, my prediction for best original screenplay is Barbie. I think that they will appreciate the wackiness and the funniness and the silliness and the creativity of creating this whole world off of just this doll and creating a really emotional, impactful uh, movie. And this group, like the Golden Globes, love rewarding writer-directors. As a matter of fact, you have to go back to 2010 to find a year in this category where the winner wasn't also the director of their movie. As a matter of fact, they actually like to nominate the director for writing and directing. So not only is it a writer-director, but the director is nominated for Best Directing at Critics' Choice as well as Best Writing. Those are usually the winners. It's happened every time in the past 10 years except for once. That was 2018 for First Reformed in which Paul Schrader won Best Original Screenplay but was not nominated for Best Director for First Reformed. And that makes sense. We can explain that away because Paul Schrader had never won a writing award before. He is known as a writer before he became a director writing for Raging Bull and Taxi Driver and that was a career award. But if you take that out every single time it is the writer-director where the director is nominated for Critics' Choice. I think Barbie, even though it's not competing for Best Original Screenplay at the Oscars, will win in this category here. Then my prediction in Best Adapted Screenplay, I went with Poor Things. And like I mentioned earlier, this group loves to spread the awards and I don't have Emma Stone winning for Best Lead Actress and I don't have uh, the movie winning for, for Best Picture. So I wanted to show it some love somewhere and this made the most sense here going for Best Adapted Screenplay. Unlike the Best Original Screenplay category, the Best Adapted Screenplay it is a little bit more frequent in sole writers who also didn't direct their film, like in the case of here where Tony McNamara wrote the screenplay and Inyoro Santamos directed it. And also, you know, the sort of number two contender would be Oppenheimer in this category. And you may think, Connor, you think it's going to win director and picture. Why not screenplay as well? And it definitely could win for screenplay, um, but I didn't predict it just because they're already rewarding Nolan for best director. And when we look at 
years where the Best Picture winner at Critics' Choice does not win a screenplay award, they're usually director-focused movies. So it's Alfonso Cuaron wins for Roma, Best Picture and Best Director. Uh, Guillermo del Toro wins for Best Picture, Best Director, Critics' Choice, doesn't win any screenplay awards. And those are sort of singular, auteur-driven, director-type movies. Even though those guys wrote their movies or helped write their movies, they're still a sort of director focus. They're considered visual stylists and directors. So they win director, they win picture, maybe some technical stuff, and that's it. And the screenplay they can give to other movies. I think Oppenheimer kind of fits that bill of being mostly a director focused movie. And that gives them an excuse to go, hey, we really like poor things. We can't really give it any uh, uh, wins in these other categories. So, hey, let's give it for best adapted screenplay. Best animated feature, my prediction is still Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. I know a lot of people after the Golden Globes are switching to the boy and the heron, but the Globes do sometimes like to make weird predictions. You know, in the case of uh, 2019, what was it? Uh, the Golden Globes went with Missing Link, and the eventual Oscar winner was Toy Story 4. Well, the Critics' Choice also picked Toy Story 4 that year uh, for this category. So. They are still a little bit more, I think, Critics' Choice, like the Oscars, with respect to this category. They will go with the more mainstream movie. They'll go with the Lego movie. They'll go with Toy Story 4. I saw even the fact that it's a sequel, I think, don't won't bother people. I think it was highly seen, highly well-respected, well-reviewed. Uh, and while Boy and the Heron is, you know, appreciated within certain critical groups, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is also critically well appreciated and I think has more general appeal, which I think will appeal to this large populist voting body. Best Cinematography, I went with Oppenheimer just because oh, I think a lot of people saw it in IMAX, so the focus was the visuals. They saw it in the best conditions possible on 70 millimeter or in IMAX and there's that constant the change of film stock being in black and white to being in color to having some of the more abstract sequences of showing the bomb going off and how it's affecting the world and kind of the, the thinkings of Oppenheimer and how that is able to sort of be intertwined into it. The IMAX was this movie's selling point and because you think of the movie you think of IMAX you think of the visuals you think of those big amazing close-ups and those grand vistas and the black and white but versus also the color just because there's so much cinematography and the focus is so much on the visuals and because the movie is so well liked I think Oppenheimer should win here for cinematography. Then best score I also have Oppenheimer. I think Ludwig Granson has the most kind of listenable score, which I think will appreciate and be, be appreciated to this wide group of voting members because maybe not everyone will remember the score of something like Killers of the Flower Moon, but they will just go on Spotify and listen to some of the songs. And Oppenheimer has an, an immediately recognizable theme that is sort of repeated throughout the film. So when you come out of the movie, even if you hadn't seen the movie t since July, if you go on Spotify and listen to it, you'll immediately go, oh right, that's that song and this song. And there's just wall-to-wall -wall music throughout the entire movie. So you're just hearing a lot of music. So I think for the amount of music that had to be created, as well as some of those earworm th uh, themes, as well as the fact that, like I mentioned earlier, they, a lot of people saw this in IMAX with ideal sound conditions and that booming loud sound. It's memorable to a lot of people. So I think people will associate that kind of sound with the score. Best song, I went with What Was I Made For from Barbie, one of the Golden Globes. I think this is going to be the song from Barbie that wins this year. A slow piano ballad from pop stars. So it's got the populist appeal in a movie that's well liked, but also has the emotional connection too. So I think this is going to be the song of the year that wins all of these awards. I think Critics' Choice is going to follow suit and predict what is ultimately probably going to win at the Oscars. Best costume design and best production design, I have the same winner being Barbie. Just because I can't get the idea of Yorgos Lanthimos' last movie, The Favorite, out of my mind. I think The Favorite and Poor Things, every step of the way, have been performing so similarly in the types of nominations that they get and the type of appreciation that the movie it ultimately gets. And if you remember in 2018, The Favorite lost out in best production design and best costume design to a movie in Black Panther, the more populist big box office movie of the year, the American movie that appealed to the critic's choice rather than the favorite, which was the international movie. And the same thing's happening here. I think Poor Things has great costumes, great dresses, great production design, very unique world. 
It's going up against Barbie, though, and Barbie does have, I think, a lot of appreciation for those costumes, which became Halloween costumes for those production design and that great built set that they actually built. That's also a, a popular movie, just like Black Panther was, and also creating a world just like Black Panther did. So I think Poor Things will actually lose out in these, category, in these categories to another kind of popular movie, just like The Favourite did um, in Barbie. Best editing, I went with Oppenheimer, has the most obvious editing, the cross-cutting between all the different storylines, all the different types of people in the ensemble, and the fact that other Christopher Nolan movies, Dunkirk and Inception, won in this category, so I they appreciate Nolan and his editing style. Oppenheimer slam dunk for a win here for editing. Best Young Performer, I went with Dominic Sessa for The Holdovers, and usually, usually they like to go with the very young kid, the cute kid, which would make sense for something like an Abbey Rider Fortson, who would maybe win for Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret. But the, the more I looked into this category, the more I realized that because this is such a large group, sometimes a lot of people just haven't seen the, the movies that these performers are in, so they go with the movie that's nominated for Best Picture. I think that's what happened last year with Gabriel LaBelle, who um, won because he was in The Fablemans over the sort of acuter kid in Frankie Corio for After Sun. And we've seen usually, you know, when they nominate the, the, the older male actor, older in this category, they're usually in their 20s. Lucas Hedges was in his 20s, 20, 2021. 20, Gabriel LaBelle was 20. And when we do see the kind of cuter kids win, like an Elsie Fisher or Brooklyn Prince. There are not any other young performers in Best Picture nominated movies, so they usually go in that route. But usually when there's a Best Picture nominated performer, they usually win. Not only that, but they do reward the 20s male. And I think Don Sessa being in the holdovers uh, makes a lot of sense here. So I wanted to go with the smart pick rather than my heart and go with Don McSessa. I do think he, he is the one that is most likely to win. Best visual effects, I went with Oppenheimer. This is actually not going to get nominated at the Oscars because it didn't make the long list. So you may go, well, Connor, maybe they won't want to uh, predict Oppenheimer because they want to predict the Oscars. That's what you said earlier, right? They like to predict the Oscars. Yes, that's true. But mostly for the bigger categories because some of these uh, technical categories there are not very accurate with the, the Oscars. As a matter of fact, this category in particular, in 2015, 2017, 2018, 2019, all those years they predicted movies that didn't win at the Oscars. So I think they're still going to go with the movie that is really well liked and I think they're going to go their own route. So they're actually not very accurate in this category. So I think it actually gives more points to a movie like Oppenheimer because it's not going to get nominated at the Oscars. So hey, let's reward it here. And they've rewarded Tenant and Inception in the past. Big explosions, sets, extensions, you know, the whole aspect. So I think people will appreciate the kind of blended effects of a movie they really like. Best hair and makeup, I'm going to predict Maestro because this uh, group, like the Oscars, like to reward movies that transform actors, actors who are nominated, like in this case with Bradley Cooper and Carrie Mulligan, who are nominated here, are transformed into these real-life people. Kazuhiro, well-respected makeup artist who has won before in this category, also does Maestro here. It makes too much sense. I think Maestro, the hair and makeup will be its award to lose this, this season. Best foreign language film, I have Anatomy of a Fall coming off of its two successes and big surprises at the Golden Globes. Even though it didn't get in for Best Picture, I explained this earlier when the nominations came out that they usually don't reward non-English language films. Look at All Quiet on the Western Front last year, look at Triangle of Sadness. Um, but they still reward those movies in this category, in the best uh, foreign language um, film category. I think this is still overall a stronger movie than something like The Zone of Interest. and. Unlike something like The Zone of Interest, it did get other nominations. Sandra Huller did get nominated in this in this group for Best Actress. Milo Machado Grainer got nominated for um, Best Young Performer. So they do seem to like this movie more than something like The Zone of Interest. So I expect uh, An Anime of Fall to win pretty much with, with ease. Best Acting Ensemble, I went with Barbie because they never reward the Best Picture winner. Pretty rarely do they do that. You know, they usually reward the sort of number two. Belfast, Trial of the Chicago 7, Irishman, Moonlight, just go down the list. Three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. These are all past winners of Best Ensemble at Critics' Choice. And what's the commonality between all of them? They're always the number two. We'll give three billboards Best Ensemble, we'll give Shape of Water Picture. We'll give La La Land Picture, we'll give Moonlight Ensemble. We'll give Trial of the Chicago 7 Ensemble, we'll give Nomadland uh, Picture. What's the number two this year? 
It's either Poor Things or The Holdovers or Barbie. Well, Poor Things didn't get nominated for Best Ensemble at SAG, so I don't think a lot of people see that as a Best Ensemble, whereas Barbie has a lot of ensemble, has a lot of notable people. Will Ferrell and Kate McKinnon on top of America Ferreira and Margot Robbie and Ryan Gosling. And then, of course, you know, Simu Liu and Michael Sarah. These are all people who are supporting in this category that have led movies in themselves. So not only does it have a, a deep uh, ensemble, it truly is an ensemble. All the Barbies, all the Kens, and I do think that it is sort of the number two in this award show. Not necessarily the number two at the Oscars, but it had the most nominations. It got nominated for picture and director and screenplay. I think it's going to win screenplay. Kind of has a constellation prize as well. But ensemble, we always see the correlation between best picture and the sort of number two prize and i think for this group their number two movie will be barbie and therefore i think we will win an ensemble then the final category i'm going to be predicting is best comedy movie and my prediction is american fiction because if you look at the history of critics choice i see this, this, this people make this mistake every single year they go with the most well-liked movie in this category right so they'll go with everything everywhere all at once because well it's, of course it's going to win best comedy it won best picture and then every year there's always some sort of weird surprise winner, usually in this category, that doesn't you know, win Best Picture or isn't a major contender. So I went with American Fiction because just like something like Last Onion last year, it's probably the funniest movie of the year, that or, or Poor Things. I think Barbie has its love with screenplay and ensemble. I have Poor Things with its love with um, screenplay, an acted screenplay, and then maybe it also gets in for, for costume or production design. American Fiction doesn't have any wins, doesn't have any wins anywhere. And they like this movie. Why? Well, they nominated Sterling K. Brown in Best Supporting Actor, which was a surprise. They nominated it for a screenplay. They nominated it for picture. So they like this movie. It's a very outwardly funny movie with lots of sort of big, broad laugh lines. So it's similar to a movie like Poor Things or Barbie, but because it hasn't won anything, it makes kind of sense to me to go, okay, here, we'll give it best comedy. So don't fall into the trap of Barbie. Okay, he's probably gonna win for best comedy, right? Because it's the most well-liked movie of the bunch. Yes, but they don't actually always do that. As a matter of fact, they do like to go with, you know, Crazy Rich Asians over The Favorite or Green Book, and, or they'll go with um, last year, uh, Glass Onion. So I think this year they're gonna go with American Fiction. But that's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure you comment below. Let me know your thoughts for the Critics' Choice Awards, what you think is going to win. And stay tuned till Monday, where I'm going to be doing a video documenting my predictions um, of how well I did, as well as what the awards and the winners mean for the upcoming Oscars. But that's about it. Until next time, stay tuned.